Just leave on two, clear take off, left hand. Take off left, it is speed one. Clear left, speed west, copy. Hello and welcome to the Blue Skies Podcast. I'm PR Ganapati, your host. It is my great pleasure today to welcome back to the program a previous guest, uh, Air Commodore Harish Nayani. Uh, as you'll remember, Air Commodore Nayani is a qualified test pilot and a fighter pilot. We had spoken to him earlier on the induction of the MiG-21 Bison aircraft. Uh, but today we're going to speak to him as part of our series on the LCA Tejas uh, because Air Commodore Nayani had a significant role to play in the test flying of the LCA Tejas. Uh, so welcome back to the program, sir. Thank you so much for speaking to us again, particularly about the Tejas. Thank you very much, Gana. A privilege to be back again on your program. Lovely, sir. So nice to have you back. Uh, so, sir, just you know, love to back up. Where were you when uh, you you were first uh, informed or told that you were going to be involved with the LCA? And what were you know, what was the environment like? What was your thinking? Uh, what were your uh, expectations at that time? Uh, yes, Gana. So, uh, as you would recall, I was uh, commanding three squadron, the first Bison squadron. I took over the squadron towards the end of 2002 and had a very, very memorable uh, tenure of a little more than two years. So towards uh, the end of my career, as all, as it always happens, I was contemplating on where uh, I would probably posted and what uh, plans did uh, you know the higher formations and the Air Force have for me. And it was at that stage that uh, I was told by none other than the chief of the air staff himself, uh, that, you know, I would probably be going back to NFTC because my services were required there. And then, of course, uh, since it had come from such a high uh, position, I really had no doubt. And uh, that really excited me a great deal because right from the time I graduated as a test pilot, it was my dream to be involved in a prototype flight test program. And I think uh, the fact that it was now coming to fruition was something that really excited me a great deal. Very nice. Yeah, I think you're all experimental test pilots, but I think very few of you get to put the you know E to work, uh, do actual experimental test flying, and I think the Tejas program provided you all with that opportunity. Uh, very true. Yes, uh, we do a lot of experimental work at AST pertaining to systems and subsystems, but uh, to do an experimental flight test program on an entire aircraft is uh, is a different uh, kettle of fish altogether. You're right. Lovely. So what stage was the program at when you reported to NFTC and joined the flight test team there? Ah, uh, Yes. So the program was at a stage when a PV-1 had just flown. We were still on the 4G control law and uh, we were flying on fixed gains. Uh, to give your listeners a, a little bit of an idea as to what fixed gains means, uh, the LPA, as most of you know, has a fly-by-wire control system wherein the fly, uh, pilot moves the control stick, but he has no idea as to what the control surfaces are doing. All that is decided by the fly-by-wire computers and an optimal control surface deflection is thereafter imparted to maneuver the plane in the manner that the pilot so desires. So in the initial stages of our flight test program, uh, as a matter of abundant caution, we were flying with a fixed gain control system where uh, the system wasn't actually fine-tuned to behave in an optimal manner depending on you know where you were on the envelope insofar as the altitude airspeed mark number were concerned so that was a, a very conservative method of uh, progressing forward uh, and in hindsight i think it was the right method because we gained a lot of confidence in the in the you know how rugged the flight control system was and after that only did we open up to variable gains that was that was where the program was at that point in time Right, right, right. And, you know, for you as a pilot, 
what is the difference in, that you experience or what is the is there a difference in feel is there a difference in handling in a fixed gain system versus a, a variable gain system yes there certainly is because uh, for instance let's say in a fixed gain system i'm at a speed of maybe 850 kilometers per hour and when i pull back on the stick i expect the aircraft to you know maneuver in a certain manner and give me the g that i'm demanding once again for your Listeners, the control stick in a fly-by-wire aircraft is either a G demand or a pitch rate demand. In other words, if I deflect the control column by, say, 3 centimeters, the aircraft will always give me, say, 5G, irrespective of what the speed is, unlike in a manually controlled aircraft where my stick deflection has to be tailored to my uh, you know, air data, what my aircraft uh, systems are sensing, and the G that I demand. So in a fixed gain system at the higher end of the speed envelope, the aircraft tends to be a little more sluggish. Whereas when you open up the gains and uh, it's fine tuned to operate in a manner that's optimal for that particular point on the envelope, you get a better control response from the aircraft. Okay, okay. It almost sounds like one has to unlearn some of one's, you know, if you're coming from a conventional controls aircraft or fly-by-wire, is, is that the case that you have to learn a slightly different way of flying? Uh, yes, it is. It does feel different uh, initially, but then it's 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 much more easy because the aircraft is doing most of what the pilot would have to do, and uh, you can concentrate on other tasks. Initially, yes, it does feel a little bit uh, different, but uh, you settle down to it uh, very very quickly. Mm -hmm. And there was no trainer at that time, so you you know the first time you flew the prototype, you flew by yourself so what was that first flight like and what was the preparation up to it yeah so what was decided was that since the lca flies uh, quite uh, similar to the mirage 2000 every pilot who was posted to the nftc went to gwalior we did a short capsule on the mirage 2000 a couple of sorties because that again is a fly-by-wire albeit uh, an analog system but insofar as the pilot is concerned you really can't make out whether it's analog or digital but that really prepared us well for the first flight on the LCA. But more importantly, we had what was called the real-time simulator located at the uh, ADE, Aeronautical Development Establishment, which was basically a uh, development simulator which was used to uh, check out the flight control laws and then port it on the aircraft. But uh, it flew so well and the head-up display symbology was so realistic that uh, it actually proved to be an excellent uh, training aid for us. So all of us flew a great deal on the RTS, which uh, prepared us for the first flight on the actual aircraft. Uh -huh. Was it a very basic simulator in the sense it was not full motion with a full visual display and things like that? But uh, at least, you know, all the instruments would react correctly the way it's Yes, supposed it to. was a fixed-based simulator. It had the head-up display symbology, which was representative of the actual aircraft. But most of the cockpit switches and all were very, very rudimentary. But it flew very, very much like the aircraft. And uh, just to tell you, even when we set about practicing for our aerobatic displays and all that, it was real-time simulator that really helped us uh, fine-tune our profile and uh, you know get the display going. Ah, uh -huh, wonderful, wonderful. So tell us about your first flight. Put us in the cockpit with you. What was that experience like? Yes, Gana. So again, uh, how it uh, was actually done was that the pilot would first do a ground run, wherein you would start up the aircraft, run up the engine, run through all the flight control tests, etc. By the way, the uh, built-in test for the fly-by-wire control system on the LCA when I joined the program was to the tune of 8 to 10 minutes. Again, as a measure of abundant caution because it was a very, very intrusive test. It went through every single mode of the fly-by-wire control system, which in itself was a great experience. And then after the ground run, you would shut down and uh, get debriefed on uh, various aspects. That was followed up by a taxi run, where uh, you just taxied out to the runway, opened up the throttle to only uh, dry power, rolled down the runway, and thereafter cleared off and came back to uh, the dispersal. After that was when we would actually launch off on the first solo. Okay. So my initial impressions about the aircraft was, firstly, uh, there was an apprehension that, uh, you know, in such a small aircraft, in such a small cockpit, uh, it would be pretty uncomfortable, but that really wasn't the case. The aircraft is uh, very, very ergonomically designed. Almost all the controls are where you'd actually want them to be. 
and um, the ejection seat is not probably in the class of an F-16 where it's raked back by 30 degrees. Over here, it's in the region of over 20 degrees or a shade more than that, which again was uh, very comfortable. And uh, what was very impressive was the view from the sides and from over the nose, which was excellent. And uh, all in all, the cockpit did feel extremely comfortable. Mm, okay. But uh, I think what really uh, was an eye-opener was the moment you pull the stick for takeoff as you began to rotate was the handling qualities of the aircraft. I can only call them exemplary. The aircraft flew extremely well. Again, uh, very similar to how a Mirage 2000 flew, but most of us, uh, or I'd say all the pilots who've flown the LCA feel that uh, she handles a shade better than the Mirage Wow, 2000. and this was an early prototype. So this is... <laughs> And even then, you were perceiving this, you know, marked difference. That's very nice to hear. Yeah. Uh, yes. And so your first flight is typically a simple profile. Uh, just it, it was a simple profile where you got airborne, climbed up into the sector, climbed up to about fifteen thousand feet, did a couple of turns, uh, and of course that time we uh, we had a G limit of just four G, and uh, also a lot of restriction on the roll rate and other parameters. So basically, it was a very uh, benign kind of a flight profile, after which you came back, did uh, an overshoot, where uh, you came down for an approach and landing, but uh, went around, and then came back and did a full stop, full -stop landing. landing. Okay, nice. <laughs> Wonderful. And then you got regularly rostered into the flying program, testing oh, yes, various yes. things. Uh, we would uh, drop a flight test program and uh, follow it. So I'm curious, you know, how many test pilots were there, and how did you... Uh, develop, you know, the break up the responsibilities. Were there specific systems that one test pilot was testing and therefore would, you know, do all the progressive tests on that system? Or did was it all mixed up where everybody was doing everything so that you'd get, uh, you know, an even balance of work? How, 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 does, how was the flight test program organized or how is it organized typically? Yeah, so how um, NFTC uh, was organized when I joined that we had a complement of uh, uh, five test pilots. The NFTC was led by then uh, a Commodore R.K. Sharma, who later became an air marshal. Below him, we had, uh, again, the ex-chief, an excellent professional, uh, then group captain R.K.S. Bhaduria. I plotted in next, and uh, after me was, uh, again, now an air marshal, then uh, wing commander Vikram Singh, and then we had uh, wing commander Tyagi. So that was the complement of test pilots with us at that point in time. And we had a team of extremely capable flight test engineers led by Wing Commander Ravindran, and then we had uh, Wing Commander, yes, Wing Commander Prabhu and Wing Commander Dash. So how it would work was that uh, between the chief test pilot and the uh, PD, that's a principal director, uh, the uh, you know forthcoming flight tests would be worked out in consultation with the designers and the engineers at HAL. And at that point in time, since most of the work was dev devoted to envelope expansion, flutter testing and such kind of tests, uh, there wasn't any distribution pilot-wise as to who would look after what. It was an equitable distribution where uh, mm -hmm. mo most of us were given a chance to fly an equal number of sorties uh, through the months, although the PDD, PD himself wouldn't fly that much because he had other tasks at hand. And how much of test flying was going on? And the reason for my question is you just came off a squadron command tenure where you were probably flying, uh, you know, day in and day out, uh, you know, particularly since it was a new aircraft, training up the rest of the team. And then you come to a, a experimental test program where there's a lot of engineering work between flights and so on and so forth. Were you getting a lot uh, of flying? And I, I wouldn't call it a lot like? uh, compared to what I was doing in the field. But then that is to be expected because after all, this is a prototype like this program. You need to tread with caution. Every single milestone has to be uh, analyzed uh, in depth. So how it would happen was immediately following a sortie, we would have what is called a hot debrief. So we would sit in the uh, briefing come debriefing room, all of us pilots, all of us flight test engineers, and more importantly, a big team of designers from uh, ADA as well as uh, engineers from HEL. So the pilot would then give a hot debrief based on his perceptions of what went right, what went wrong in the sorting. And again, to just um, give your uh, listeners a flavor, Every single flight in those days and well after that was monitored in the telemetry room. 
So the telemetry room, if you walked down, walked into right, it, you would right, probably right. feel that you were in a control room for the, you know, <laughs> missile testing or the yeah, space shuttle or something like that. Space and shuttle. every single <laughs> right, parameter, right. believe me, every single parameter, however minute, was monitored real time by the engineers and the test director sitting there. So after the hot debrief, we would all uh, disperse, and the next day, we would have what is called a detailed data brief where uh, numbers, graphs, parameters would be projected and any uh, you know uh, deviations from what was expected by the designers would be flagged, discussed and analyzed to a very, very great detail. And if it was a, uh, something that required a fix, that would be fixed before the next flight. So as you would imagine, the flying effort per se wasn't uh, what uh, you know a pilot would like it to be in terms of the quantum of flying, but then that's how it uh, had to be done, and that's how we did it. Right, right, yeah. Is, is there a concern, uh, you know, that your currency, your skills are getting rusty because you're not flying enough, or are you all at a level of proficiency and professionalism where that doesn't really make much of a difference? Yeah, the latter part of what you mentioned is right to a large extent. And to answer the first part of that um, question that you posed, uh, yes, the RTS again came to the rescue. So anytime we were free and had things to do uh, in terms of checking on the flight control system, software updates, we would off, uh, be off to the RTS, spend about an hour or two there and hone our flying skills as well in that process. And in addition, uh, those of us who were qualified on certain types of aircraft at ESC would often go and fly probably the MiG-21 or the Jaguar there. So flying skill uh, wasn't really an issue at that point in time. It wasn't an issue. Okay, okay. And you were involved with the first flight of the PV-3, if I remember correctly. And so tell us about that. What, what were the new modifications introduced in that? And what was that first flight like? Yes. So PV-3 was uh, a, a lot closer to the IOC, that the initial operation clearance version of the aircraft. As far as the cockpit and uh, some of the flight control uh, system issues were concerned, the aircraft had a third MFD which was placed uh, in front of the cockpit, uh, in front of the control stick, right in between the pilot's knees. It had what an open architecture computer um, architecture is called for the avionics. It had a new upfront control panel, which was just below the head-up display, uh -huh. okay. which, uh, yeah, which gave the pilot a lot of flexibility, a great deal of flexibility. And also certain modifications to the air conditioning system and other uh, you know, utility systems on the aircraft. Very nice. Uh -huh. So uh, to tell you how we went for the first flight, I did mention the real-time simulator. In parallel, we had another very, very useful device called the Iron Bird. Ah, right. Yeah. So the Iron Bird, uh, as the name itself implies, was a device where all the hydraulics, the uh, utility systems of the aircraft, the landing gear extension retraction could be done. In, in the lab, which was located at the Aeronautical Development Agency, and we would run, you know, a whole lot of tests on the Iron Bird uh, till the point where you know we were satisfied that uh, this particular system is now rugged enough and it's unlikely to fail in the air. So PV3, of course, every single aircraft's first uh, flight was preceded by umpteen number of tests on the Iron Bird, on the RTS, after which uh, is when we went to the aircraft. And what uh, then Ekomodo RK Sharma had also instituted was a what-if session. So we would sit with the designers and the engineers and uh, discuss as to what if this went wrong, what if that went wrong, what if the flight control system misbehaved, what if he sprung a hydraulic leak. And uh, it was done so very thoroughly that uh, when I went up for the first flight, I was absolutely convinced that nothing could go wrong, but if anything did go wrong, we had the wherewithal to deal with that problem, problem and bring the aircraft back safely to ground. Mm -hmm. Very nice, okay. Mm -hmm. And so the first flight was... Uh, yes, so the first flight was... Uh, can you describe that sortie uh, to us? Yeah. Again, uh, at that point in time, we followed the uh, SOP of not retract the, retracting the landing gear after getting airborne. Again, again, yes, as a measure of uh, abundant caution. So I got airborne, kept the landing gear down, and uh, within the limits of the speed that was permitted in that configuration, did a couple of uh, basic maneuvers. 
and then came back and landed. And in the event, it was a flawless flight, and I really enjoyed myself because uh, the displays behaved absolutely, you know, meticulously without a problem at all. The flight control system in that particular version again behaved beautifully. It was a real joy to fly. And so, sir, this is a segue to my next question, which is you were involved a lot with the development of the multifunction displays in the Tejas. And, you know, that does sound like a really, you know, very, very complex work is, you know, figuring out what needs to be presented at what time, how the pilot interacts with it. So tell us about that process. What is the thinking that went into it? How did you develop these, test them, refine yes. them? So on this, I must compliment the team at ADA, the avionics team led by Ms. Padmavati, who rose to become a very senior scientist at that point in the program. Uh, so uh, a lot of documents would be prepared beforehand as to what were the display formats in various, uh, you know, pilot selection modes that uh, could be displayed, what what was required, what was not required, and how how to make it better. Again, uh, this involved a great deal of discussions uh, with the designers, either at ADA or at uh, uh, NFTC, and once again at ADA. And y'all were who who was specifying these requirements, and what was the research that went into you know were we comparing other aircraft and how they presented information, and then writing our requirements, or how, what is that process? Uh, yeah, so this, we would have brainstorming sessions within NFTC to begin with the five or six of us. Uh, a little later on, uh, now Air Marshal Tiwari and Tiwari also joined in with a lot of experience on the Mirage 2000 and me with my experience on the Bison as well as the Sukhoi 30. So we would all sit together and decide on what was the best format for each uh, mode that was available. And uh, a lot of inputs were also given by uh, Commodore Malankar, who was then also in the program. And our discussions would carry on literally for hours, for hours and hours. And then we would finally, uh, uh, you know, zero down on the prof on the uh, you know format that we wanted. We would then um, uh, discuss this with the designers, that Parmavati and her team, who would then port it onto the integration rig at uh, Ada. So that's when the pilot machine or the man machine interface would be checked out very very thoroughly. And once we were satisfied with the particular format, uh, it was frozen and then ported onto the aircraft. Unrelated, but also somewhat related. I used to, I used to be, uh, you know, the head of product management for my financial information startup, and I had a usability expert, a user interface design expert, working for me. Mm -hmm. And in a previous life, she had actually designed interfaces for F-16s. Wow. So, you know, what information is presented, what icons are used, what colors are mm -hmm. used, you know, that sort of a thing. And so, and then, you know, it was just amazing to see how the amount of testing that she described oh, yeah. went Absolutely. into it. They used to study how people play video games and then, you know, design their interfaces so that it's intuitive to those people. Very cool. So would you bring in like a, you know, completely... You know, somebody from outside the system and show them a display and see whether they could perform certain tasks and whether they could understand the information that is was some of that sort of usability testing done uh, it wasn't done uh, uh, precisely because of the fact that you know when the moment a pilot um, uh, undergoes his uh, test pilots training at ASD one of the first things that he is told is you are the interface between the designer and the young flying officer out there in the field so you need to think like the flying officer, while your understanding has to be at the level of a designer. So from that point of view, we would always, uh, you know, relate everything to what a pilot in the field, a junior pilot with uh, limited experience would require. What is the kind of problems that he would be faced with and then tailor the system accordingly. I think the aim is the same more or less because uh, Okay, understood. Yeah, that no, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, great. Can we change gears a little bit? Say you had spoken about uh, aerobatics routine being practiced in the simulator, and you know you did the aerobatics routine for Air India in two thousand seven, if I remember correctly. 
um, what stage was the aircraft at in terms of its envelope and what was that routine like? How did you go about practicing it? And what was the experience like to actually fly it finally in front of the crowd? Yes. So this was the first time that uh, the flight control team led by then Dr. Sham Chetty and very, very able, ably assisted by uh, Dr. Girish Diodare, who's now the PGD at ADA, uh, discussed uh, the whole thing with us to a great detail. And uh, a 6G control law, uh, control law was slowly opened up. And even more importantly, this was the first time that, you know, the PGD, that the Air Commodore Sharma at that point in time said that we will now carry out a vertical uh, profile as well. Oh, okay. Hmm. Till that point, we hadn't carried out a loop. We were limited to uh, barrel rolls, rolls, high G turns. So we did a couple of loops which were very closely monitored, you know, in terms of how much height would you gain on the first half of the loop, what would be the speed on the back, how much height would you lose whilst coming down. Again, this was preceded by practices on the RTS. And uh, it was then decided that, yes, for Aero India 2007, the LCA would carry out a complete profile, including vertical maneuvers, such as a loop and the roll of the top as such. So uh, it was my responsibility. By then, I had become the chief test pilot, and I had to uh, formulate a aerobatic display profile. So I did go through certain profiles that were followed by uh, Indian uh, display pilots as well as, you know, the Gripen uh, display program, the Rafal display program. And uh, I uh, uh, formulated a profile, had it approved by the PGD, by the PD, sorry, practiced on the RTS. And then myself and then uh, group captain AP Singh, who had joined us, were nominated as a display pilots. And uh, unluckily for AP Singh, he was uh, to fly the uh, TD2 which still had a four and a half G control law. So his profile was a little more uh, benign to what I was doing on PV2, sorry, PV3. PV3. Uh, and uh, yes, the profile uh, as such was uh, pretty impressive. And uh, we received a lot of compliments from those present at the air show, both foreign as well as, uh, you know, Indian uh, pilots, uh, flight test engineers and the crowd and General. Right, right. I know it's been a long time, but do you remember what the yeah. profile was like and what the if you every describe? single maneuver, every single moment <laughs> of it? <laughs> right. Can you describe it to us and what, what yes. are the things you did? So, to begin with, we uh, fueled up the aircraft to just about 1200 kgs to keep the weight light and also to make sure that the landing weight was uh, at a you know figure where we could also demonstrate a short landing if required. Mm -hmm. So and we would taxi out to the takeoff point, uh, run up the aircraft to full military power, that is maximum dry power, release the brakes and go into maximum afterburner. Immediately after getting airborne, uh, as the wheels were coming up, we would throw in a turn to the left, a very steep climbing turn to the left, uh, displaying the plant form of the aircraft to the crowd behind. Lovely. Mm. And then uh, reverse the turn to the right. That means you initially turn left, climbing up, switching up by about 35, 40 degrees. Thereafter, turn right, get down to about 100 meters, and then fly along the runway from right to left. In this uh, flyby, we would do quick 360-degree uh, rolls, one to the left, one to the right. Wow. And once again, do a right climbing turn, displaying the platform to the crowd. Come in from the opposite side and do an inverted flyby, just about 100 meters above the ground. My goodness. Wow. Okay, then from the inverted flyby, we would uh, revert to normal straight and level flight, mm -hmm. turn away from the crowd, and uh, display a, a minimum radius turn. Uh -huh. If I remember correctly, we would do this at about 500 kilometers per hour indicated speed, pulling the maximum possible G with the stick fully back. This was with maximum afterburner, and as you would imagine, with its high thrust to weight ratio, the aircraft would actually accelerate slightly during this turn. Wow. Mm -hmm. So uh, to demonstrate the aircraft's agility, immediately after the turn, we'd get into a vertical loop, a proper vertical loop, and then complete the loop, turn around once again uh, towards uh, you know the other side of the runway because we couldn't cross what is called a foul line and we couldn't come anyway close to the crowd. And thereafter, we would do a max G turn, turn uh, downwind, and thereafter carry out a curved approach. 
where uh, we would commence our uh, final turn just as we were abeam the you know edge of the runway that's a landing threshold and then uh, come in and land and uh, use the tail shoot demonstrate the landing capability uh, capability of the aircraft and then taxi back wow wonderful so the whole performance was just about 6 minutes or so amazing amazing uh, i'll see if i can find a youtube link and maybe post it of that uh, of that display but i really i could visualize it perfectly as you described it to me just now so thank you so much for that okay um so you know um, i was reading about this thing that you were involved with called the transonic drag rise problem so uh, it's great to me so i just love for you to explain what transonic drag rise is and how do you go about testing it and what is the problem and how did we fix it yes so one of the things that struck me when i first went to the program or even before that when you know i was following the program very closely it, it was evident from you know the initial pictures photographs of the lca that uh, you know uh, the fixed geometry intake on the lca was not really tailored for uh, sustained flight at high supersonic speeds indeed even uh, aircraft like the mig 21 the mig 23 the mig 29 and the mirage 2000 have uh, some form of variable geometry in the air intake to optimize it for supersonic flight <laughs> so without this form of variable geometry the aircraft would probably not be able to sustain a speed higher than typically 1.4 to 1.6 mark and this is exactly the same limitation that even aircraft like the f16 and the f18 both of which have uh, fixed geometry intakes uh, suffer from although on the uh, super hornet the f18 ef uh, they have you know addressed this issue and they have some form of variable geometry and i think the supersonic performance on that aircraft is better so on the lca what uh, i would like to state was that she pretty uh, briskly accelerates through the uh, transonic barrier but after mark 1.2 the acceleration is sluggish for the very same reasons that uh, i talked about because of the fixed geometry intake and in addition the uh, installed thrust losses also figured leading to a situation where uh, we were forced to accept the uh, supersonic performance that was available given the constraints and uh, it was decided that since uh, that part of the envelope the supersonic envelope above mark 1.4 1.5 is rarely used in combat uh, we could actually proceed ahead and continue with the rest of our flight testing i am sure that you know with the incorporation of the g414 engine which hopefully should come up on the lca mark 2 this particular problem should get sorted out to a large extent okay okay right so for the lay public can you explain what happens at that point which causes this in- inability to go beyond and why does a variable geometry solve that problem yes so what happens is the moment an aircraft uh, goes supersonic there is a shock wave that uh, is produced at the air intake lip or in case you have a cone like in the mig 21 at the tip of the cone now this uh, shock wave has to be tailored so that it impinges just on the lip and the airflow within the air intake becomes subsonic right uh-huh. it may seem a little difficult for a layman or a lay person to understand that while the aircraft is flying supersonic how can the airflow inside the intake be subsonic subsonic right yeah but that's precisely how it works the air intake when it is tailored for proper supersonic performance it uh, optimizes the pressure recovery within the air intake by keeping the airflow subsonic by the time it reaches the face of the compressor now if you do this then the air the engine is operating a lot more efficiently and uh, you know you'll have much better supersonic performance understood understood great super anything else that you were involved with the lca that i haven't asked oh, yes. you about the first, uh, uh, r73 the first r73 firing oh my goodness tell us about that <laughs> <laughs> yes so now it uh, the uh, lca was uh, envisaged with a you know configuration where would she she would always carry two r73 missiles because that at that point in time was the best missile that we had of course when the aircraft was initially designed she was designed around two r60 missiles a much smaller missile 
but that uh, went out of vogue and was phased out long before the you know program actually started uh, gaining momentum and we had to switch from the r60 to the r73 missile and so for the audience who don't know what an r73 is can you just briefly tell us about that uh... yes the r73 is a russian missile uh, which is also called an a4m all aspect air combat missile when i say all aspect uh, what happens is when we had the first generation of missiles the sidewinder aim9 yeah, i think aim9b was the first version in parallel the russians had what is called the k13 which our initial mig 21s came with now these missiles can only be fired if the target aircraft is in front of you and moving away from you right mm -hmm. in other words the missile has to be exposed to the heat generated by the exhaust or the hot jet pipe of the target aircraft and the infrared uh, spectrum was also tuned to the, those particular wavelengths this posed very very severe disadvantage in air combat as was realized during the vietnam conflict and others as well where you had to really maneuver aircraft your own aircraft to get behind the enemy wait for your missile infrared lock uh, you know tone and then shoot the missile right so it was decided that uh, you know the missile need uh, had to be modified to home on to the you know the hot plume of the exhaust gases as well so this gave rise to the first generation of what was called close combat missiles in the indian air force we got the matra magic 1 which was integrated on the mig 21 bis then i also think on the jaguar which could fire at a enemy aircraft or an adversary which was even 90 degrees pointing away because the pika head was now uh, fine tuned to home on to that particular spectrum of the infrared energy so the then uh, pika head technology was uh, improved to such an extent that you could now fire at an aircraft which was now head on to you absolutely head on provided his afterburner was on okay so what the missile would do was it would home on to the exhaust plume of the aircraft which was visible to it behind the fuselage and then the, of course the control laws were modified so that the missile could head towards the aircraft and the warhead would explode uh, you know by means of proximity fuse designed to create maximum damage to the target aircraft so the r73 belonged to this class of missiles all aspect air combat missile it had a nitrogen uh, uh, bottle which would cool the seeker head because the seeker head now needed to be cooled and all in all an excellent missile uh, it's done very very creditably for itself in various uh, exercises so the lca was now integrated with the r73 missile and you uh, the, the bison also uh, integrates with the r73 isn't it and i think if i remember correctly abhinandan used uh, r73 to shoot down the f16 is what i hear absolutely the bison as well as the mig 21 9s were uh, upgraded with r73 and so were the sukhoi 30 okay uh -huh. okay great so tell us about the uh, test program for the r73 on the lca so when uh, the time came for us to plan these flight tests certain very very important considerations emerged one was when you test a fly by wire aircraft you begin with uh, what are called ground vibration tests on the ground followed by structural coupling tests what happens is uh, as the aircraft flies through the air there are certain vibrations that the airframe picks up now these vibrations if they are wrongly detected by the flight control computers they could give inputs uh, undesirable inputs and make the aircraft maneuver when the pilot doesn't want to maneuver worst case scenario it could be even lead, uh, lead to certain you know conditions of loss of control uh -huh. that is one issue the second is uh, related to flutter again for the sake of your listeners who may not be aware a flutter is a phenomenon in the air wherein due to the interaction between aerodynamic forces the elastic forces of the aircraft structure and certain vibrations that set in uh, you know if the interaction uh, results in a situation where these are self induced and can carry on to an extent where they can cause uh, problems you need to address these mm -hmm. right. in the worst case you could also have structural failure where you know the wing could actually break up and lead to catastrophic damage so all these tests are done on the ground so that you can preclude uh, any of them occurring and if there is a problem 
we had a fantastic team once again like i told you led by dr sham chetty and girish who would uh, you know install what are called notch filters in the flight control software to disregard this particular you know spectrum and thereafter you continue as normal that is a flight flight control computers would uh, handle this particular problem now all these tests were done with the missile suspended on the launcher now if you did fire the missile and you didn't have the missile you just had only the launcher all this had to be repeated ah oh, correct yes. if you know what i mean so this was done as a starting point the second issue was the uh, effect of the exhaust plume of the r73 on firstly the air intake of the aircraft on a stable operation of the engine and on the composite structure and just to let you know the r73 uh, exhaust plume is considered rather for want of a better term dirty because it contains it contains a great deal of phosphorus and uh, this this could uh, you know give rise to uh, disruptions of the airflow in the air intake leading to problems with the engine operation and in a worst case uh, situation the engine flaming out that is failing completely and uh, the other problem we envisaged was if this exhaust plume at a very very high temperature impacted you know or uh, made contact with the aircraft structure all composite wing structure of the aircraft would there be any damage right 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 mm. so this had to be studied and once again it was what i called jugad which we indians are so very good at so what was done was an r73 missile was stripped off its warhead and the electronics and the guidance and it was just a rocket motor which was strapped on to a test uh, bed at hyderabad with uh, dr uh, drdl they had the facility to test this and i remember uh, wing commander ravindran and myself and a whole lot of us from ada and hal went across to hyderabad and did this test so we were cocooned inside the control room which was completely shielded from any blast or anything that could occur and the r73 missile was fired up the plume was very very closely captured using cameras in all kinds of uh, spectrums infrared visual for offline analysis the thrust of the motor was uh, measured and uh, the whole thing finished in about 6 seconds from the countdown we you know got the rocket motor burning and within 6 seconds it was all over and what was so amazing was to give you an idea the thrust as measured at that test bed was 6200 kg that's the thrust of a mig 21 type 77 oh, engine in full afterburn my goodness <laughs> isn't that amazing and just a little missile no wonder you know it accelerates so fast now does the r73 drop and then the motor fires or it fires no, off the rail fire on the launch it fires it's a rail launch it's a rail launch okay yeah all infrared missiles are rail launch most of the radar guided missiles have a ejector or a, what the russians call a catapult launch so this missile Uh, fires off from the rail and then uh, proceeds towards the target so once we had analyzed all this data we decided that yes it's now safe to proceed uh, the disruptions of the airflow uh, were unlikely to affect the air intake and the engine would continue to operate stably the uh, you know the composite structure wouldn't be subjected to the hottest part of the plume is what was uh, you know uh, yes model and we went ahead and did the firing at goa so we ferried to goa myself and uh, then commander maulankar as a standby pilot the aircraft was prepared it was pv1 at that stage and uh, we needed a photo chase so we had requisition the indian navy who were kind enough to give a harrier trainer which uh, filmed the entire operation so uh, we did a couple of uh, dummy profiles where i would get airborne with the harrier you know get used to the profile when exactly i would fire the missiles what radio calls i would give so that nothing would be lost out and the camera chase would capture everything uh, very very correctly mm -hmm. finally went up and fired the missile of course i did uh, have uh, experience of firing missiles from mig 21 bison mig 21 bill and also the mig 29 so my countdown of course started once the camera chase had kind of confirmed his readiness and i fired the missile it uh, was what one big whoosh and before i knew it the test was over and uh, i could see of course the missile 
plume uh, moving away from me after which the uh, pro, you know the fuse was uh, activated and the missile exploded that of course i could not see because it's far away from me over the sea right right and this was the carriage and release basically this was uh, yes okay carriage and release because the rest the so guidance was, systems and all that are all well proven so yeah, yeah, you didn't need to test all launch. that right yeah this was an unguided launch and thereafter i think uh, tyagi and the others took on the guided portion of the launch that need to be yes So, you know, I've been asking all the test pilots I've spoken to who've been involved with the LCA test program. You've been a, a squadron combat pilot. Um, you know, what is your sense of the aircraft that we have now that's in the squadrons? Uh, you know, the, would you, what would you reckon your chances in uh, combat against the sorts of adversaries we face in the subcontinent? What's your what's your assessment of uh, the platform that we've created okay to begin with uh, i think what's most important for a fighter pilot in a combat scenario is to have the best possible situation awareness uh -huh. and this is one area where i think the lca reigns supreme or i would say she's uh, probably up there amongst the best in the world the, the 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 way the sensors are engineered the way the displays are presented to the pilot and uh, what all he has at his command are uh, something that uh, I think our pilots would be extremely happy with. Mm. So if you built up your situational awareness and you can tailor it to a situation where you have the opportunity of a first launch, your uh, chances of uh, you know winning a uh, combat uh, engagement are that much better. So that from that point of view, the LCA is absolutely amazing. Next, coming to weapons. I wouldn't like to dwell upon what exactly have now been integrated onto to the LCA, but once again, they are world class and they give our pilots a tremendous edge over the ad adversary, whoever he may be. Right. Mm -hmm. But in the same breath, I'd like to say that yes, the adversary also has comparable or probably a shade better missiles in certain parts of the envelope. But all said and done, uh, we are very, uh, very, very evenly matched insofar as weapons are concerned. Then. The next point is the RCS as well as a visual signature. The LCA today is the smallest fighter aircraft flying, period. Mm. Oh. And in air combat, small is beautiful, both in the beyond visual range arena, because the smaller you are, of course, there are various other aspects, but it's uh, but natural that your radar, radar signature would be that much smaller. And when you come in close uh, in the visual arena, small is what every pilot probably wants. So not only the aircraft very small, the F-404 engines are virtually smokeless. So the aircraft is extremely difficult to spot uh, in an air combat scenario. So from this point of view, once again, uh, I think our pilots uh, would be extremely happy with the aircraft. And then, of course, when it comes to actual maneuvering, the aircraft is pretty good. Not as good as what was envisaged initially when, you know, she was on the design boards. But all said and done, she can hold her own against even an aircraft of the category of an F-16 or probably even outdo a JF-17, which I think is uh, excellent capability. Superb, superb. More importantly, her, the flight controls are absolutely marvelous and uh, she flies very, very well at low speeds. So if a pilot does happen to get into a low speed situation in air combat, the aircraft has a huge delta wing with uh, very, very low wing loading. Wing loading is a, a simple term. Uh, the total uh, weight of the aircraft is divided by the wing area and the lower the wing loading the better is the maneuverability at low speeds and uh, it has a great advantage even at high speeds okay thrust to weight ratio once again is uh, pretty good again not as good as what uh, was in visage but uh, i would say fairly decent so all said and done an excellent little platform and i'm glad our pilots have now gotten to fly this aircraft after so many years and I'm sure they'll uh, they'll do extremely well. Okay, amazing. Have you had a chance to interact with some of the operational pilots in the squadrons who've been flying it and get their feedback? Uh, yes, I did interact with uh, Group Captain Rangachari, who commanded the first squadron, and then the display pilots who come to uh, Yalahanka for the Aero India show. 
they are absolutely delighted with the aircraft. I do understand that there are some teething problems to do with the initial induction for the technical issues, yes. But all in all, they are extremely happy. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful conversation to you know learn about your um, involvement with the test program of the LCA and to learn about the aircraft some more. So I can't thank you enough for your service. Can't thank you enough for the time you've spent with me today. Thank you very much, Gana. Thank you. It's always been a pleasure interacting with you. Well, folks, that's all we have time for this week. Join us again next week. In the meantime, sign up for updates at blueskiespodcast.com. There you'll find links to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can also write to us with your comments, questions, suggestions, and feedback from the website or to blueskies at prganapati.com. Subscribe to the podcast on any podcasting platform such as Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and even on YouTube. If you like what you heard, share it with your friends, give us a rating in your favorite podcasting app, and write us a review. It will help other people find us. I want to give my thanks to Saurav Chaudhia for our logo and Prithvik for the music. I want to reiterate that all the views expressed here are personal and this podcast has not been approved by or reviewed by the Air Force, Ministry of Defense or any branch of the government. In the meantime, stay safe and Jai Hind.